Hey everybody, this is Scott with Witness Underground, the documentary. We are live in a Kickstarter campaign right now, witnessunderground.com. Please go check it out. We have seven days left. It's coming along strong, but we need you to check it out and spread the news with us. It's awesome. Thank you for showing up. Today we have with us Augustus Watkins. He has been, he's actually, his music is in the film as part of the soundtrack. So we're going to highlight his work and Anthony Mathenia again um, as a co-producer on Witness Underground. Thank you guys for showing up. How you doing, Augustus? Doing good, doing good. Good to be here. I, uh, I supported, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a patron on your campaign. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Everyone good follow his it. example. That's right. No, it's good to see it. Uh, it's good to see it happening. Like, um, it's fun to see it popping off, you know, like that's a lot of people and it's, uh, a lot of, a lot has been pledged. It's really cool. I'm excited about yeah. that. Yeah. We're at 60, we're almost 66% today. We're almost at 200 backers, 197 as of this moment. It's very exciting. It's, it's happening. It's nice. It's validating to see people like, oh, wow, that's a really cool project. Mm-hmm. Three. And- What's that, Anthony? Uh, the three backers we oh, need three to, to go. 200. Yeah, yeah come <laughs> on. Back. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, come on. I've been there. <laughs> I sound like NPR. We need three more backers. <laughs> yeah, our goal sure, today sure is 200. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on, we can do this. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been really exciting and i um, really happy that this is, I mean, this is the moment we've been planning for for five years. The day we, the day we in, like incepted the movie concept, it was like one day will change the way people see this community, see how they, how they how they look instead of looking back into their past with this traumatic moment, like be happy with your mm-hmm. present, make art, be express yourself and and be excited about your future with your creativity. And um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about being in Ghost Army? And I know you're working on different projects. We'll get into that in a bit um, with your label. But how how was that? How how does that feel to have your music in a movie? Have you ever, are you in that space? Have you ever done anything like that before? Yeah. You know, no, it was kind of funny because I got like a, um, I got like a text, you know, so I'm, so I'm in ghost army with, um, with Chad, who's in the film and then our kind of mutual friend Merritt. And one day I just got this text from Chad. It's like, Hey, ghost army is going to be in the documentary now. Um, that's that. And I was like, okay, cool. Great. So that was like my, um, I like, which like, which is great. So it was like a really kind of fun way to just be like, you are thrown in on this. Like the music's in there. That's the end of that story. Uh, <laughs> which was really exciting for us, you know, and I, I didn't really, I'm not part of the, you know, the, the community, the, you know, the witness community, the ex witness community. Um, and so I never contextualized ghost army as, like in that framework right like okay. i know um and i've played i played a lot of shows um with you know cindy and eric um the, you know did a lot of sh- like um i'm in the credits on the on the um uh, uh high tv r- record which was kind of oh amazing. Very, that's really cool yeah did you play um, high tv is one of I the bands we really feature in the movie yeah yeah no i didn't play but um i uh for some reason I'm like listed as like a thank you in the, okay. <laughs> in the credits. And I'd be like, I barely knew them at that point. So I, I must've had, you know, I don't really, actually, I never really actually knew what that was about, but uh, so like, I have like history, you know, like with, but like, I don't think about them. I don't think about high TV. Um, like I, like you said, like I just contextualized them as like a, you know, band of people who I know, like a, a like a rad band that I can go out and see. Um which is cool. So I met, I'm sure I met Chad through that scene. I know I met Chad through that scene. Um, he um, is such a cool player. So, you know, I would, I was really liked what he did and just his like approach to the instrument. And, um, and I knew him as a bassist and um, you know, as we got to know each other more, he, I started to see his like, it's like he could actually play guitar too. And I was like, Whoa. And, um, he's just got like, he's like a tone master. Like he's a good player. He's like, he can do cool stuff, but just like this, the way he can architect a guitar tone is just like masterful. And so we knew we wanted to do something. I was doing a lot of bands at the time. And um, so we enlisted our friend Merritt and Merritt plays bass, Chad plays guitar and I play drums. And for me, drums is not my, like um, my main instrument or like my native instrument, but I, I just, uh, I kind of just wanted to, 
you know, try some different things. And I was drumming in another band um, at the time. So I kind of, so I just wanted to kind of open that up a little bit and see what I could do. Uh, and that band was so fun because we really like, it was about just getting together in the room and we just, we would, we jammed first, right? We just, it wasn't like, Hey, I've got some songs and let's hear some sheet music and we're all going to play. It was like, let's get together, vibe out, have fun, be friends first and let that relationship express itself through, you know, like through the vibrations of our instruments as well. Um, which is a really fun way to work. And from that, these songs came out and, there, you know, it's funny. I said so this was around 2015, 2016. And um, then we recorded, a, we recorded, uh, we put out this record in 2016. And um, I still listen to it from time to time. And I'm, I'm shocked at like how good the band was. <laughs> like when you're just, when you're at the, at the time, you're just making music, you're just doing something. And, um, and then all of a sudden you come back and you're like, oh, wow, like this is um, uh, this is actually like even stronger than I realized at the time. Yeah. It's interesting just hearing you talk about it because I actually had no idea about the the relationship behind the band. So I really appreciate you sharing that. That's a unique thing that most people that appreciate music but aren't necessarily in a band wouldn't even necessarily think about how a band works. And it's, it's really a social, social yeah. animal. It's a community yeah, absolutely. thing or a family thing. You're really, in a lot of ways, you're dating. Like, um, yeah. and you're you're dating, you know, so the, if there's three of us, like you're you're dating two people at once, and those two people are dating each other at once. Like, right. And and, <laughs> and, and, and it can and really and it can take that level of intensity, like with the, like it's you know, it's a very intense thing to create music. Um, and the relationships and they're, they're like basically every band is a little bit dysfunctional. Like it's not really it's like, it's not really possible to have like HR and like a strict structure. And like, you know, like it's not like every band is necessarily. Like messy, dis- yeah. Yeah. Messy polyamory. Yeah. Without, yeah. Yeah. Makeup sex that makes it all work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get these makeup jams, uh, which is like <laughs> almost like you really, you'll be like, you like, you come in and you're like, oh, I'm really, you know, cranky. Cause, cause you know, merit was, was, uh, uh, you know, whatever and then you're like but we got practice we got a show we got to go and then all of a sudden you're like you're like jamming with this with this group of people in this room and you're like oh, i fucking love this guy you know <laughs> like <laughs> like it's all good he's so dreamy <laughs> it, it um you know what we create it's together is so much bigger and so and it really does it really is a lot like that i that's like it it's uh um i don't know there's like there's no other quite there's no other relationship like being in a band in my opinion um yeah. i think it's a really special and really unique relationship and now i've been not in bands for i was in a lot of bands um around the time i was in ghost army and now i'm not in bands and i like i might be a more functional person like on the the, the wide world but uh i definitely miss the uh i definitely miss the experience of being in bands yeah there's something special about being on stage going live the, all the, the 10 hours of practice you do for your 40 minute set, you're going to have. On yeah. The um, and all it, that's it, like beautiful thing. It, the, the thing for me is the, like the sink or swim ride or die together thing. Like, mm-hmm. like, especially with a real band, like a power trio, like ghost army was, we're just drums, bass and uh, guitar and some vocals. Like you can't take one of those instruments out and have the thing work, especially with ghost army, the way those riffs, uh, the way the, the music was, you know, intertwined, mm-hmm. like, the, a band, if an instrument isn't there, it ceases to be a band. Uh, it, it's like, and you could like listen to when you're like, if you go on YouTube and find like isolated tracks of like your favorite bands, or just like listen to your favorite CD and just like listen to um, just what the guitar is doing or just what the bass is doing. And like, imagine if like a person just went out there and was like, go, 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 <laughs> but you put you put like a cat to cat to cat to cat behind it, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, like that's the the power and the magic of a band is like the way that we 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 need each other, and mm-hmm. and the and the way like if someone slips, you got you got like you got to catch them like musically, you know, like or someone messes up, and you've got to like 
kind of catch yourself on stage and it's like you're in front of people. And so there's like this, there's like this anxiety, but there's this camaraderie. It is um, just an absolutely magical headspace to be in, in, in all the, in all the ways. I love it so much. I'm like evangelizing being in a band. Everybody <laughs> should just join a band, I guess. Yeah. But it's an act of presence to play an instrument alone. And it's an incredible act of community mm -hmm. presence to do it in front of an audience with all the, all the pressure of, of a performance and people ex their expectations of you actually like being awesome and then yeah. following through and doing your best to do that. It's yeah. I haven't done it in a long time, but I, I do miss it. Is a special high that comes from that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Nothing like it. To, to include Anthony here a little bit. Um, Anthony and I have barely touched the scratch the surface of that scene and all the music that's in the movie. We, we got to go to a couple concerts back in the day and then we've sort of like, I've never seen any of the bands in the film play live, except for what we shot that's in the movie live. And so like, I'm a super fan of ghost army and you guys are super rad. Um, high TV as well. They're amazing. I've been listening and soundtracking this project to, yeah. um, to this music for now for seven years. And so I'm like, I almost want to manifest the, the concert to happen. And we really, really tried for the, the big um, film festival and sound unseen film and music, which is happening right now um, again um, this week. But like to, to they, were, they do live concerts with the film screening as like a duo. And mm -hmm. I was so excited to see um, high TV puff puff and Ryan play for the first time in my life that day. But anyway, super fans. And I know yeah. Anthony, I'd love to include you in this um, as a fan as well of the music scene that is and was. Is there anything you wanted to offer there? Just wanted to spend 10 minutes. I wanted to like make sure you had a voice. <laughs> Maybe he can't hear us. <laughs> yeah, he might be no. delayed. Okay. Yeah. Hey, he right. might be having yeah, some trouble. Signals, he had some trouble earlier. Yeah. Pop in anytime. Um, well, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm oh. getting like every third word. Oh, okay. I'm getting every third word, so it's really bad on my end. So I'm having trouble following the conversation. So if you pitch it to me, like, what do you think? I don't know. I think Ghost Army is <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate that. I do yeah. too. Yeah. Stay stay away, stamp firm, grow mighty. It's like a nine minute saga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's some really powerful riffs. And there's actually a scene, mm -hmm. and this is kind of a fun behind-the-scenes um, thing. When we were filming all the parts where Chad's at CC Club being a bartender, mm -hmm. his previous job, um, where we get to highlight actually a place where a lot of us met each other and hung out after mm -hmm. church or like in oh. between music and church stuff. We would go to the CC Club and listen to the jukebox and drink a little too much. Um, so it's kind of cool to include that place in the film. Um, but he put on Ghost Army in case that I was able to use some of the raw audio from those scenes so like the entire time we were shooting there was like a one hour he just like had ghost army on loop so it was like oh, nice there's no moment to get it in there live but then we ended up putting it in as like a proper track yeah. later worked it in but yeah um so i wanted to get into where you're at now you you've done some exciting things since ghost army and you've moved to los angeles um tell us um what's going on in your life and what are you working on yeah so I, it might be worth setting up so like when i was um like when, when in around the time that the the documentary was being filmed and I was doing Ghost Army, um, we were doing Ghost Army. Um, I was in a, um, I was like, I did a um, a residency at an art gallery, and I released five albums in five months with five different bands. Um, wow. And that was like a whole. So, and so Ghost Army had been was a part of that and that whole project, which was called Genre Beast. Um, it was a big, really huge undertaking for me. Like I like had to like, quit a job to do it. It was a, you know, it was a huge project. One album and, a month is insane with like RPM challenge. A lot of the guys, a lot of fans in this film um, worked on the RPM challenge. Oh, right. right, right. Knocked out. And that sounds similar, but like way crazier and more intense. Like RPMs once one album in February. Yeah. Yeah. And, I like, know people do like, like an album would be once that. a year or something, or like every couple of years you put out an album, which is like a collection yeah. of like years of work. Um, so do five in five months is insane. I've never yeah, we did like a like CD that. release show for each, each one. It was a whole, it was a whole big thing. And then the kind of the like the the funny part was like at the end of that, it was like my big. It was like um, it was like my big vanishing act. And then I then I left. I left Minneapolis. Um, oh wow! And I lived out of a suitcase in Europe for about two and a half years. 
Oh, wow. um, and that was where I, and then settled in Prague for a year and a half. So I was in Europe for a great four spot. Years. Yeah. I love Prague. Really yeah. cool city. Cool, very cool city. Um, and so during that time I had, so I'd always been this ensemble musician. I'd always been in bands and um, the only way I really knew how, like I could, the only way I really knew how to complete a song was to like do it in this social environment to like get people together. Um, towards the end of my time in Minneapolis, I was kind of figuring it out how, how to be solo, but moving every three months to a new country, being in a place you can't speak the language, like there was no time to like, to like build up a band, uh, no time, space or literally money to like build up a band. If you're um, moving then the people change or you're it, changing the location. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, so that during that time I picked up a, I bought a ukulele from a, um, from a, a shop in London. Cause I, you know, I like sold or stored all my gear was living out of suitcase. So it was like a really big, um, um, it was like a big sacrifice actually to hold, a um, to carry a, a ukulele around, but I did it. And, um, I learned how to write, um, kind of for myself on this, on this goofy little instrument. Okay. And, um, I've really fallen in love with it. And so now I like, it, it really kind of is the bedrock of everything I do. I play now. So I, I started a, um, a project called Bijou Noir, uh, which I started while I was, you know, I started writing that stuff while I was living abroad. Um, I did like the, I wrote an album while I was living abroad called Expatriarch, which was kind of just me examining my relationship to, you know, like, um, to this was 2016 right so to, just to like um it's like a lot of stuff was happening in in, in america and like a, like the country was really kind of reckoning with itself as far as like For what people that don't know history could you give an example of what was going on then uh there was a pretty uh interesting election that had happened and i was and i started in the uk and so they were reeling from brexit too mm. um you know and, and talking to europeans there was like they're like they were really like a lot of people in London were shocked about Brexit. Like, how could this happen? We, you know, we were shocked about the 2016 election. Like, how could this happen? Mm -hmm. um, and um, talking to um, some Italians, you know, like on a train, and they were like, yeah, we were shocked about, was it Berlusconi? Like, we were shocked about him, but then, like, it all yeah. kind of worked out. And so, you know, it was like, so I ended up, like, doing this really, like, examining my relationship to, you know, my home country, examining my relationship to, like, the patriarchy to like my relation, like was a lot of like kind of examining my relationship to like gender and um, like in the patriarchy and America and all that stuff. Uh, so I wrote this record um, and ended up like learning how to play the ukulele and learning how to write on the ukulele as I did this record. And then um, I, th I th and then by the time I got back, um, I ended up kind of getting stuck in the States because of COVID. Um, and that's how was, I felt. I yeah. Felt like COVID stuck me in the United States. I yeah. Like, oh. It just seemed <laughs> I like I live abroad again. Yeah. But at the time it was like understanding those, you know, following those um, health guidelines mm -hmm. was like difficult in English. Um, yeah. And it just felt like I was getting like emails and like reading like this official stuff from like the Czech, you know, like the Czech ministry of health or whatever. And just being like, I, can't i this is too hard this is too yeah. scary and at the time it was scary so right um uh so yeah just ended up kind of was actually in the states at the time and just stayed in the states yeah. um so as a result ended up releasing the record in the states um that was called expatriarch and then um shortly after that uh, and then around that same time i was doing a like a s electronic experimental electronic project called tulip tiger uh that does like a lot of like um it's like really like i say this it, it's like the kind of weird stuff you might like put on in the background while you're cleaning your house, you know, like just, just weird um, experimental. It's like, gets a little housey. Cool. I really like big beat. So it's like, it has that like, um, uh, like that acid big beat kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. I do, um, I do a, which I've been doing for about nearly 10 years now um, uh, called death dance, uh, which is me and this, um, I, my, my great friend um, and a close collaborator uh, who goes, who promes by the name of kept. Um, and we do death dance together. Um, and those are the kind of, so like, those are the three that I'm really active on now. And I'm, I'm starting a new project. I'm in the process of doing a, 
doing a, I guess it would be a fourth active project because God, I just can't stop myself. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. So what is it about making more than one at a time that drives you? I, how do you yeah. manage that? I don't know how I manage it. I mean, like, cause on top of that, like I've got a record label a PR firm and um, I also do a podcast. So like, um, I honestly don't like really, it's like the, like the glib answer is like, have a really good calendar system. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, like creatively, I think for me, I just have a lot to get out and a lot to say and a lot to do. And, mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't really be, I don't really care about like what name all this stuff goes out under. Um, but you've got to sort of like, it ends up being sort of arbitrary, but you've got to have lines drawn for like, what is going to be this project? What's going to be that project? Because I think people do turn to music for whatever reason they turn to music, right? Like I've, I've got something that this hole inside of me or this need, or, you know, this like ache and this music is going to put the thumb on that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's like a, for me, it's an act of respect for the audience or for listeners to sort of say like, this is what, this is generally what you're going to get out of this, From this label, fill in yeah. the blank label, this kind of sound. I can expect something like that from them. Yeah. It worked for me. That one song worked for me. Maybe the next song will work for me too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can be pretty disparate. I just think for me, that's just sort of the solution that I have, mm -hmm. um, which is why I it's keep interesting. I was talking to a good friend of mine about, music and how it fills a hole emotionally you mm -hmm. mentioned that and and sometimes it's like okay well i'm feeling a little bit down or depressed i'm gonna listen to sad down depressed music and i'm just yeah. gonna swim in that for a yeah. while and other times it's like well i'm down and depressed i want to listen to something that lifts me out of that but it's almost like music can carry your emotions with you like i don't know in some way and i, I think that's a really interesting way to like to make a body of work that fits something for somebody but for you. And then hopefully the other people's resonate with it or something. Can you speak? To yeah. That? Yeah. Uh, I am the reason why going back to 2016, the reason why I did a, um, a residency at a gallery in, at an art gallery is because I really do feel that music is, um, is an art form. It's a sacred art form. And in a lot of ways, music gets, shunted into its own little corner it's like like i went to art school um i dropped out but I, I i did go and um you'd go and it's like you know painting and and sculpture and even furniture making some of furniture making is is fine art oh you have to excuse me my microphone's dropping um there we go uh furniture making is, is fine art but somehow music isn't hmm. and i and i find that to be really I find that very objectionable. I, I think that um, because what you're saying, like people, if music wasn't fine art, then why is it that you can put on a song and be moved to tears? Right. You know, like, I don't feel that way about chairs usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <make> a contrast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not the biggest sculpture fan either. Um, you know, but there's paint, there's, 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 there's visual art, there's painting, there's fine art that just, you know, is like, um, just thrilling to me, thrilling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people um, conscious, unconsciously understand that music is a, a you know, fine art form is a sacred art form, but they don't necessarily treat, it's not treated like one. It's a lot of time. It's treated as it says commodity. It's treated as background music, background noise. Um, it's something you do, something you put on while you do something else. I mean, Spotify, um, who's the biggest streaming service by far, they don't even see themselves as being in the music industry. They like, I, I caught this quote that he says from, from, I think from Eck, he said, Spotify sees it. We are in the moments business. Hmm. What the, what is that? Like, <laughs> like they don't even see themselves as being in the music industry. They're like, they just see themselves as like, as like, as background, you know, as like, as hmm. some sort of like curator of, of noise um hmm. around around you while you do something else um and that is so like yeah, they're like in a social situation business rather than a music business yeah yeah it, like oh. a, a mood setting business um oh. and that's that's very you know i find that very objectionable maybe that um, aligns with their um the way that they pay the artists 
Yeah, and I think it does. And I think it aligns with why they can come up with a billion dollars for podcasts and um and then and then still just like and, and then and then actively work to pay artists even less um mm. when they're the you know while they're billionaires. Um that's but, yeah that stuff. So get, I we can get into the business of it. It's actually interesting because there's a parallel with film. Like Amazon used to pay a really decent rate compared to other streamers of 18 cents per one hour of viewing yeah. of a movie, which doesn't sound like much, but now they pay one penny per hour of viewing. And only if you can maintain a certain kind of like comment rating system based on people that are actually like engaging with it and writing reviews. And if you're below a 50%, they won't pay you or they pay you less than a penny per hour of viewing. They have to finish the full hour. Or they won't pay you anything. It's like, how, how, why do you, why does anyone work with Amazon if that's what they're doing? Yeah. They went down less than 18 times over two years from two years ago. They used to be able to, used to be able to run a business working with Amazon and they're the biggest streamer in the world, like mm. Spotify for music. Yeah. Just to give an example of like so, what's going on in the, in the world here. Amazon is the biggest streamer by like by volume. Like they have the, they're the most content the or library. they have the most, yeah. the most, the most content in their okay. library. Do I they can't, the- I, I pay them and I can't even find it an available title that I don't oh, have God. to pay more for, which makes it kind of like a non-useful. System yeah. At this point. I did. I did catch something. I don't know if this is true, but I'm going to repeat it. Um, that the average streaming service typically has fewer titles than you would have been, than would have, what would have been available like at the blockbuster or the video store. Oh, in the really? corner. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It was like, I'm, I, so I've been thinking about that, like thinking back to like, you know, wandering the, 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 the aisles of a video store. Um, it seemed like, especially sometimes, you know, these big ones, I come from a small town, but um, I don't even come from a town. Um, I come from a very rural area, but it seemed like these video stores, especially like when you get into the city, they were just, they were just forever. They were infinite. Endless. Were, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's true, but it's, it's really interesting. So then like, it is true. Like, you know, I've got a few streamers that I'm paying for right now and, and then why why is it that I'm still like, you know, at least a couple times a month, still you know paying three four bucks just to just to rent one, anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a unique world we're living in. The whole the whole industry is sort of upside down from what it was a few years ago. Like it's it, really really rapidly changing. It is. Um, you know, the tech businesses got involved in content and, um really nothing was been the same you know this whole this whole wave of strikes out here in la um i haven't watched it too closely but it is at the intersection of a few things that i'm really interested in like i'm, I'm very interested in you know, union politics and you know leftist uh, leftist politics um so you know i watched those things from that angle and one of the things that i think really struck me is that this is the first time there's been uh a major strike that the tech companies have had to contend with. I'm sure there's been some here or there, but this is like one of the reasons why I think this has been drawn out um, is because this is the first time that like Amazon and Apple and Netflix, it's, it's Netflix's first strike. Oh, wow. You know, and it's not sag after first before. Yeah. It's not sag after first strike, you know, um, yeah. but it's, it was Netflix's. So I think they really thought that they could, uh, they could, you know, throw their weight around and be belligerent. But, uh, but, uh, um, I guess in some ways, I guess, and I don't know, like uh, it does speak to the power of, of a union. Cause in a lot of ways, it seems like so much of our lives are really, um, uh, we're just sort of caught under the, caught in the wave of what these tech companies just can do to us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I read somewhere we're no longer in a democracy. We're in a techno dystopia. Yeah. Or like something like that. So yeah, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, like, yeah, you, know, you have because, to pay for subscriptions to have basic services Yeah, yeah, yeah. to core private corporations that basically rule the world and can pay off politicians because yeah. we live in a country, especially in the United States where they got, they legalized corruption with lobbying. Right. So now, now you have these big tech companies who can enforce anything they want because they actually write the laws. Yeah. And that's been true for a very long time. Like oil companies are writing the laws for a very long yeah. time and still do. And now yeah. also the three trillion dollar companies that we all require to do our jobs, right? Or you know right. whatever the world, yeah. To do rapidly, yeah, to, like into. I can't get out of my parking garage without my phone. You know, like, <laughs> you're trapped. Yeah, wow, I wouldn't be able to do it. So I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's 
yeah so like the the music so you know getting back to like the you know, music and film like um they they really have come along and just sort of are running the show now for us in a lot of ways um do you think that what's your sense of there being like a, a reaction to that right is there is there an underground is there a is there a pushback against that in that's in, a good question in, from your angle and thank you for bringing that up so i one of the reasons why we're running the Kickstarter is because we have found a path that other indie filmmakers have taken to get around a lot of problems in the film industry. Mm. Um, where there's a lot of gatekeeping and um, pay to play, pay to play situations, and um, like one of the distribution angles I had as a, a sales rep, and he repped the film, but he couldn't sell it. He tried to. He went for some big players. He went for Netflix. He had an angle. He's a post house in L.A. Nice guy, Eric M. Klein, glue post, shout out. Um, and then we moved to another another player, Alex Noah at Blood, Sweat, Honey, and we paid him a fee, a flat upfront fee, to go get us deals. And all the deals he was able to get us, um, they were legit deals, but they're very parasitic where they want us to pay like ten to thirty thousand dollars upfront or pay ten thousand plus they take the first thirty thousand and then we get our cut in residuals after that but then like everyone i talk to is like yeah that's the entire amount that your film is worth so they will take that and then you will have nothing because mm. that's the entire life of a movie anyway I, I was i learned a lot about parasitic companies so in in the case of where we're at we're taking an indie route it's actually solved by a tech company um called film hub is one that we're working we're going to work with to distribute okay. our films independently but they take an 80 20 split just get into the weeds about it but it's like this tech company is actually coming in and disrupting a very parasitic film industry where people are sucking up all the profits and taking away your rights to the art for 10 to 25 years in their contracts. Hmm. And it's, and they might not even um, show your film anywhere because they own it and they don't care. It's just one more title where for me, this is like not just a movie and it's not just my the right. first movie I'm making. It's like an important part of the global community and I, I care deeply about it. And so does everyone right. who worked on it. And so do all the artists who are involved in it is why they donated their art, including you guys, with the Ghost Army, mm -hmm. to, to make it um, more successful, more powerful, more emotive to affect social change. And so to have some, some random company who's the bottom feeder or parasite in LA or wherever um, suck up all the profits and shelve our title was like absolutely not getting involved at all. And I talked to every, for example, the best one, I talked to every director who had distributed a documentary with them mm. and all but two is like 25 of them got right back to me. Like, I'll call you directors are like, I'll call you and tell you the horror story. Oh, let me, I'm so mad at them. Yeah. I, you know, it was just like, Oh my God. And all those emails flooding. And I was like, Oh, this is not a, this is a bad, bad company to work with. I actually really liked the people there and I thought they were really honest, but like they've never successfully distributed a documentary where a director got a dollar. Wow. So like, a bad a bad deal over bad 12 deal. years of, of effort on their part yeah and, yeah and they're making money off of it but they're not right 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 right. right meanwhile their kids are going to private school and right. like you're like what yeah yeah so i didn't want to get wrapped up in that i'm so glad i kind of was i learned enough from a few independent filmmakers we met along the film festival run like that have like guided me they're like that's a misstep come back and like, mm -hmm. we'll try this over here to call this person, get with this company. And like, I found a lot of places that like, they gave me a lot of pathways that were dead ends. And then we finally were like, okay, this, this is going to work for us. Yeah. So we land on something that's really good. And we got a good team of people and especially bringing Anthony on more recently has been awesome. He knows a lot of things that I'm not aware of. And he's working with some great um, filmmakers, um, Seth Ferranti with outlaw films. Right. Uh, you can't, I don't know if you can respond, but Anthony's doing some great stuff and, and, and we're, and Justin Giddings, who's I've, I've hired him to do a lot of stuff um, with our film festival run. He got us, he helped us get into 11 film festivals. We won an award following his guidance. And now he's helping us out And in the Kickstarter is actually like, we're finding our crowd and that's part of the crowdfunding. Uh -huh. So it's, it's like, you need, you really need like 1 million people to care for your film to be successful or to watch it over the mm -hmm. course of like the first few years. Yeah. And so it's about like, how far can we go? fully indie and then we need to hire someone like you with your pr firm um to help us like actually get press that will find the more general audience we don't need ex jehovah's witnesses because we made a movie of ex jehovah's witnesses we don't need right, musicians right, right. like you because we made a movie that happens to do with music and mu musicians and art we need people 
that are going to watch this film because it's a good story. Right. Like, yep. I'll watch a documentary about a beetle. I don't have a lot of personal interests and knowledge about beetles, but I will watch a documentary about it. And I want people to think of this movie as like, it's great storytelling. And that's because we had like 40 people come out of the woodwork to like, oh, let's make this thing awesome. Let me do my part. Let me do my part. Totally. We got graphics from Belgium. Um, we got a, a woman from Georgia to do the story edit. And you know, the list goes on and on in like 32 different bands. And um, yeah, like just a lot of of community support like it's it's a it's a movie it's in the top 10 5 to 10 percent of movies from the year it was made um that's why i got into so many film festivals that's why it won an award yeah yeah tech company Fil- solving our problem in a, in the sense to answer your question yeah but filmmaking is so collaborative it's like it's it's never you can't you can't just like go into a cave and come out with a film right like you've got to it's inherently a social experience right that's that's what I'm learning. I mean, I from the beginning wanted to make it a community thing. I even invited the people the movie's about into the filmmaking process, which is usually not how it works. But it's like it's so much their story, and they they were excited to be a part of it on that yeah. level. But yeah, like and now I know from deep personal experience that the reason why credits are so long and why there's so many names attached, <laughs> yeah, you need all of those people, or you don't, or you have a, you just have a YouTube channel and you just have this live interview and like right. it's not a movie it's a, just a youtube channel right right a different animal completely that's a good point i never thought about that that is like one of the big even though some of those youtube channels also clearly the you know are having crews as well yeah. um it's uh yeah yeah it's like even the best like solo content creators are like have teams behind them exactly it's um i think that's something that's like probably maybe underappreciated in any creative field um, is just like how important communication is like how important it is for, 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 for you, for one, for someone to be able to just communicate patiently, communicate intently, communicate with, with presence um, and do it well, do it effectively. Just say like, identify, like, and it's a, it's a, it's a huge process, right. To like identify what it is that you are feeling. Think about how that might need to get articulated, articulate it and do it in a way that is, um, has a, like that the other person can receive. And then that other person or those people, then they have to do their part to like receive that kind of can actually think about it, you know, maybe give a little bit of charity or like, you know, understand the context from which the speaker is coming from. And then that might give them um, some, you know, desire to go do something or they'll understand something so they can go do their jobs or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be when you're communicating. It's so, it's actually really complex to communicate. And I think a lot of people think it's really simple. Um, so I should say this and then you should hear it. And I used to kind of operate in that way. Um, but I think the truth is, is this communication is very complex and it's so important in the creative fields. And I think anybody who's out there trying to, I, I, I imagine make a film. Uh, and I think it's true for anybody who wants to like break into any part of a creative industry, um, like learn to learn to speak clearly, your thoughts clearly. Um, and I think just importantly is like learn to actually listen actually listen because a lot of people don't yeah it's great advice i think one of was a big learning curve for me with just when we we actually crowdfunded the production of this movie um to go shoot it in minneapolis um we raised eleven thousand dollars five years ago and um when I, re- I read a book it was like a classic book on editing i can't remember the title but it's like white with black letters and it's just like <laughs> people have been using it since 1980 or something yeah and I was like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a crash course. I'm really a wordy human. I mean, I have a podcast now, but I'm much more articulate than I used to be. And then when it came to writing, like I would have like, here's a block of text and, and like, here, here it is world. But now I'm like, okay, well, how can I say that in two sentences? Like, what yeah. am I really trying to boil down? And I'm much more careful about what I publish and what I write. And that was a huge learning curve right up front. It's sort of when you do a crowdfund, I learned, um, or even just like pitching a movie or putting like a pitch deck for a script uh-huh. that you want to might maybe make in the future. It's like, well, what is exactly the idea? Articulate your whole plan. And then people might care about making that movie in the future. Um, 
it, it's really interesting to make a piece of art. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Maybe making a piece of art, you can be, you can be all over the place, but when you like go to try to package it, you need to get your communication really solid. Yeah. Yeah. The art, the, the, the act of speaking about your art is so it's thorny. Yeah. It's, and it, it's fast and not everybody, I'm not saying it's easy. Um, I like, because I, you know, I, I have a record label. Um, and I, I want to get into that. PR, so, so, yeah. So we speak about, we speak about other people's art. And so yeah. like, but it, and it's so much easier for a third party to come in. But I think any, right. it's so important to be able to come in and just like, at least have a couple of, you know, uh, at least I think it's really important to at least have a couple of nuggets so you can talk about your art. Um, you know, a couple of a couple yeah. of chestnuts you can uh, reach for. People talk about like getting your elevator pitch. Like, what's your yeah. what's your one in a film? It's a log line. What's your one sentence about your film that you can tell me, and in like a single breath? What yeah. is the point? Why should I care? Yeah, and, and getting that getting that solid took a really long time um, for me. And it, like when we, Ryan and I went to the first film festival in New York City, um, and and that was really interesting. So we're like, what's your film about? Oh, it's yeah. And then we, we see people like they're like, yeah, okay, I don't care anymore. Yeah. They're like they exactly they wander off their tension waivers. And then at some point, like a couple of film festivals in, I was like, it's about artists who escaped a cult, and people are like what, what? Like yeah <laughs> half a sentence focus on the topic um they're intrigued i don't tell them that they that they got out of they got people were in a high control situation and it was really difficult and like now they miss their mom and people are like what are you, what are you talking about yeah. <laughs> yeah so and it took a while for me to even like the film hits on so many notes that are important to me it's like i didn't even know where to start like right. what would even intrigue an audience because for me it's like it took me years of my life to package the movie, which is 80 minutes. How do I take 80 minutes and turn that into a single sentence? Right. Um, when you're the person who started with, with hours of footage. Yeah. Like 20 hours of content. <laughs> yeah. And not to mention all the, you know, hours and hours and hours of conversation that, that, that led to those 20 hours of foot and the pre-production yeah. and the journaling and like all the stuff that you did. Right. To like, yeah. Just to I mean, that, that I made a series before I did the film and we actually crowdfunded to continue the series called XW coming out, which is, I would interview one person like we're doing right now. Mm. And that person would tell me like their, their experience with faith and religion. And then what was the moment that changed it? And then now what is their life like, or what, what happened after like that realization? Yeah. And, and then what is their life like? And usually they were musicians and I would like, okay, so let's like use your music to carry the story and how did music help or art making? And then like, I'm soundtracking their life, their modern day life with music. And it, it, people, I don't know, I think it's still amazing and I'm, I keep it going. Um, but it didn't really hit. And I think, um, the concepts were all being prototyped. Like this mm -hmm. movie, the five, the three years we spent actually doing the production and post-production were preceded by like two years of me trying out the topic yeah. in a series before we yeah. actually coalesced and to find the thing that's the meat of the topic to like hit on in a movie. Yeah. That's, you know, in, in, in songwriting there, I, 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 was, I, I, I feel bad that I don't know who to credit this to, but um, this is not my original thought. Um, that there are certain songs um, that are actually poems set to music. And there's mm -hmm. kind of a difference, like, especially with like very commercial songwriting, which I don't necessarily do, but if from that lens, um, like there are songs that are like, well, this is nice and you needed to get this out and this maybe has some poetry to it or whatever, but like, this isn't going to be a certified, you know, platinum hit kind of thing. But it, because it's that skill of kind of knowing like what, like, or there's that, there's that tension between like the, I don't know, like the miasma, right? Like just like this, the stuff that's like floating around in your head is like raw material that you can pull from. And it can take a long time to, to take that and refine it into something that can be a one sentence pitch at a, yeah. at a film festival. Yeah. I'm fascinated it, by that process. Yeah, no, it's, it's an amazing journey. And I imagine with so many bands you've been in and all the people that you work and write for work with and write for that, you're kind of becoming really solid at it. Whereas you know, I did it with my own piece of art to like bring. Yeah. But like to do it for other people's art all the time, it must be really interesting. Which the hardest part is to do it for yourself. Like I can't write my own. I, 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 um, I don't write my own press releases. Right. Like okay. 
I, I'll write yours. I'll write yours all day long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, that, I, that's actually an interesting point about the filmmaking process that keeps coming up in interviews. And I'll just bring it up. Is that like, how, why did I not include myself in this movie? Mm. Well, it's a lot easier to tell someone else's story. Yeah. Even though my experience is very parallel. So I'd like to tell that like the movie's autobiographical in a sense, I, even though I'm not in it because so many pieces mm. were parallel and similar to mine. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so much easier to, to do that for someone else. And that, and I think, I don't think the people in the movie could also could have done it. I mean, they could have, and not to say that they don't have the skills, but like emotionally it was a lot of challenge, a lot of challenges. So like to have the, the objective sense that I'm telling a story about someone else, mm -hmm. I just know what points to hit on in yeah. their story. Right. And you know how to ask really great questions because you've, you're like, you're not like, you're not exactly an outsider. Just like, so yeah. what's it like to be a witness? Like you've got to, right. you know, first answer, you really know how to like ask the questions. Yeah. Could you, um, before we wrap, we've got about 15 minutes left. I wanted to really like get into, um, what's going on with your record label. Like, yeah. um, how, how is that going? What do you, what is the purpose of it? What do you offer? How does the business of it work? Like, it's really exciting that you're like, you're in our greater network in the yeah. underground and nuclear gopher universe. Yeah. And, um, and that's how I see you're, you're part of our, our community, even though you didn't necessarily have that same exact experience, but yeah, I, uh, have someone who knows the business of music, right. I'd love your perspective. Well, I, I, I you know, I'm, 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 I'm honored to be a part of the wider network too. I, you know, I, um, I knew a lot of these, you know, people who are in the film. So it's like fun to see how that come out. You know, obviously Chad and I are very close. Um, so like, that's really fun to see. Um, so around 2017, um, I mentioned earlier, um, my, my, my good friend who, who performs under the name kept, and we'd had this band called death dance and he, I was living in Spain and he called me up and he was like, do you want to start a record label? And I was like, say less, let's go. And so we, um, so we had a lot of discussions kind of about what we wanted to do and what the purpose was. It really does go back to what, um, what I was saying earlier, like, our, I mean, our, 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 like our slogan, or I guess, I don't know if it's a slogan, but like we do, like we do say music is a sacred art form. So we're called give take. Um, it's give slash take um, on all the socials. It's give take life. Um, we focus on largely we focus like our, our sort of main thing is like we call it auteur driven electronic music or you know music with a darker edge so a lot of times it's it's people with like singular visions we're not um we're not like doing well i don't want to say what we're not we're doing a lot of stuff with people doing singular visions people with like really strong ideas of what music is a lot of times it's and a lot of times it can be a little darker uh, but we've got like straight up synth pop and like really boppy stuff too. Um, it's a lot of, we have some classic industrial artists on there. We've got, um, like I said, some sort of synth wave kind of stuff. We've got experimental electronic. We've got like harsh noise. Um, we've got um, uh, house music, um, you know, the post-industrial kind of stuff. It's a lot of um, different genres that uh, we've got a death rock band on there um that is all like no no synthesizers you know it's just straight up gun, drums bass guitar and vocals um so can you name drop a little bit just to give some people context of like the kind of artists you worked with and the, the level the history maybe of the few yeah the bigger ones yeah so just today we dropped uh a single from nesh um who is um uh who's been around since the you know since the not since the 90s or since the 80s i would say um doing um uh industrial he was in kmfdm and now he's solo has been solo for many years um and uh Very i mean cool. re really like kmfdm is huge they yeah were really really popular in the 90s yeah least. like to, for me like I, I i said if there was a a mount rushmore of industrial you know ash would be on it um he's you know somebody really special um we did a david j record who was the um basis for uh, bauhaus and love and rockets um, uh, Mona, Mona Muir, she's another, like, just her history is she's in the like, um, eighties, the color in eighties survivor. Like she's been, um, she's collaborated with a lot of like big eighties, you know, she's been around since in, in Berlin is since forever with like electronic music. She's a, um, a composer by, by day. 
Um, let's see. We on just, that note, I want to drop something. One of the most amazing and influential films that inspired me to make my first film about music. This is my second film about music related to music. Mm-hmm. Um, I consider the the music in in Witness Underground to be like the set. The story is like it could almost be anywhere else in any other you know part of the world, but like it's set to music and it's set in like a music community. Yeah. Whereas the first movie I made was about a music community and oh. a venue and and a music um, a label like yours. And actually, they have a really similar motto. Yours is um, give take. Yeah. And and theirs was give first take later. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's first and last records out of out of Tokyo um, with Koremoto Toraka. Okay, good friend. He's a great dude, um, and they ran Rec Room. Rec Room was a, a music venue and a recording space in okay. Hanoi, Vietnam, and so that, that's called Hanoi Mixtape, and that's uh, available on HanoiMixtape.com. Hanoi um, but what was I going to say? Uh, oh, oh, the the music, the movie that inspired me to make that in Hanoi was in. Oh, it's on your side. Oh, there's a siren. Um, the mu- the music that inspired was called Love, Lust, and Sound, 79 to 89, West Berlin. It's a very long title. Um, it, it's something very similar to that, Love, Lust, Sound. And it has to do with 10 years, 79 to 89, until the wall collapsed in West Berlin mm. and the end of communist rule um, there, that, um, or outside of West Berlin. And, and it was this guy from Manchester who was like flipping through vinyl. And then he just moved to West Berlin. So he was, everything that was cool and interesting. Yeah. Electronic, like, the electronic was like coming through out of West Berlin, hitting Manchester, like record stores. He's moved there and lived there for 10 years. And he, he was like a newscaster. So he would like do music news out of West Berlin. Oh, wow. Embedded in the scene, early noise, super early punk, early industrial, early EDM. Yeah. And the movie blew my mind. And then we like got to talk to the director on, it was like a, a Skype video after. And I was like, that was like my first film, um, like film festival style experience. And it, I was like, God, I was with my artist friends. We were already making music videos and mm-hmm. cool stuff. And I was like, what if this is like the inception of banana Island films, actually. I was like sitting in this oh, room wow. talk to those guys. I was like, we have almost the same community here. We're living in a communist world where music is a bit oppressed art is oppressed people like people have to struggle a little bit and and like there's an amazing international music scene here and we're all all of our friends are musicians and they have their own venue holy shit like let's yeah. talk let's make a thing about what we have we already shot a year worth of stuff let's just like get the interviews and then we have a movie and they were like oh my god let's do it so we made a movie oh wow um, yeah cool nice love I was that your steam away but yeah yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, Not at all. thing to talk about her being out of berlin and like early in that space yeah like, working with her it's like she probably knows people that like maybe oh i imagine so yeah i imagine so yeah yeah she might even be in it um cool. she's yeah, like whenever yeah, something whenever awesome. something cool pops up it's like there's mona like awesome she, yeah <laughs> she's been around uh you know i think one other one's probably worth just plugging is um is uh we're, we're releasing um uh, it's called scorpion tea they are a, they're a death rock band. Um, it's Ed Leo Dowd, who was in Toilet Boys, or is, is you know, Toilet Boys, has a solo career. He was the drummer for like the last 15 years of um, Psychic TV. Um, was cool. very close with Genesis. And um, we'll have to put all these links in the show notes. I'm not familiar with them, but I want to be, and I want the audience to know who you're working with. And yeah, what's yeah, yeah. your label again? Give Take. Give Take. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, nice. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening, and we're... Um, really we're really excited it's been we've been at it now for six years if somebody wanted to work with you as a label like i guess what would you provide and and then how could they uh, get in touch yeah it's interesting like it, a lot of times it's it's funny it's it's less about what we provide and more about what you as an artist need um because okay. every artist has like their like special combination of what they you know, what they have, what the what kind of team they have, and then what their what what spaces and what holes they have. Because mm-hmm. we're an indie label, um, we really do see ourselves as like whatever you've got going on. We're a, we're a multiplier. We, we put you know wherever, wherever what direction you're heading, we can put wind in your sails. Mm-hmm. Um, we can if so if you're not really going anywhere, we can't really take you much further than than nowhere. It's kind of like multiplying by zero. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you got really cool stuff going on, um, and you you know you want support, uh, then we're there. So we do, the, like we do digital and physical. So one one of the things is that like 
when you're at the point where you need to start doing, you know, CDs, cassettes, um, and even vinyl, um, I think that's a good place for, for at least for us that we can really jump in and, um, kind of provide a lot of support and the, um, get you into record stores and that kind of stuff. It's kind of hard to do on your own, um, doable on your own. And the thing is like, it's funny. It's like, you have artists who are like, why would I, why, why I don't, I don't need you. Why are we having this conversation? And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, then you don't need us. Like if you right. don't think you need us, then you don't need us. Like it's not it, because the music industry has been somewhat democratized, you know, um, mm-hmm. if you don't want us like, but it's funny. Like, I think like if you're, if you really know what you need out of a label, then like, um, you should start talking to labels. And I, my advice to people who are like thinking about it is like really understand what um, what you're doing, what a label c- might do for you, and then start having conversations um, because there are there are really great. We have really great partnerships with with a lot of our artists, and it's it's really yeah. really cool. It's it's such an interesting topic that I think I'm a very DIY person, and I think mm-hmm. a lot of people in our community that are in the film and then orbiting that world are very DIY to yourself. And that and we're in a world where you can do that and all the education's out there. Like you mm-hmm. said, like you you've learned how to do it. And yeah. you've been in and so there anyone can learn how to do it if they really want to. But it's totally like, well, do you want to make music or do you want to like try to get CDs um on shelves? Um yeah. or do you want to like have those relationships and do the business side? Do you want to do it uh, and get 10% of what's possible or like 1000 X your your growth and your audience building? Because right. like like for example with the movie i i worked with this group that was like how do you it's like film festival mastery is the is the organization they teach you how to like run the film festival world. yeah you can learn it all online but you're going to make a lot of the missteps they kind of accelerate okay. the knowledge and then they're like yeah you you spent money to learn this but i'm going to tell you where to spend some more money spend money on a real trailer using this trailer editor mm. and it was like 1200 bucks and I had, I'd spent two months of my life making like five versions of different trailers. And I sent them to all the people I knew in the film world and all my friends. And they were like, no, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And I sent them the one I hired. And they were like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Wow. And I'm like, it's all the same stuff. And they're yep. like, no, no, it's totally different. It didn't, yours didn't work. That one, that's an art form. And like, I wasted two, two months of my life you know, half-assing a trailer. Right. Uh, and I just could have spent it and then spent most two months of my life making more movie stuff or like re- doing the writing or getting into film festival or doing the communication, doing yeah. the part that I was excited about. Um, and I think it's like learning where to spend money and like how to accelerate growth and like getting someone like you who has the deep knowledge and the connections can can take something. Yeah, I have five, I'm going to put 5% of my energy into this thing I don't know how to do. And part of that is hiring you because you, yeah. can, you know exactly what to do to happen in a month rather what would take me two years to do yeah i think it's really really important um and just like and and i also respect anybody who's like you know that's not for me i really just want to and like i want to run it myself i'm you know i'm i'm the master of my own universe and like i i you know respect that so much that's your vibe that's that's really cool um Mm -hmm. but the people who do you know but uh but we you know we want to we want to connect, you know. So like, it's important for us. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, t- give take. Uh, can you say the the website URL yeah. for everybody? Yeah. So uh, the the record label is called Give Take. It's uh, Give Take dot Life. It's uh, at, you know Give Take Life on all the socials, uh, including Bandcamp, Give Take Life dot Bandcamp dot com. Um, I am, I perform under Bijou Noir, which is, um, B I J O U N O I R. That's French for like dark jewel. So that's Bijou Noir Muse, no, Bijou Noir Music on all socials, Bijou Noir Music on all socials, Bijou Noir.co on online. Um, Tulip Tiger, which is, has a couple different handles. So you just have to search for that one. Um, that's the electronic stuff. And then, um, my kind of goth, we call it future goth, future goth duo called Death Dance. Um, that is official death dance on all socials. Very cool. Really appreciate you coming on today and dropping your knowledge and um, also like diving into the creative, like the, the emotions and the personal experience of being creative um, with, with all the different music projects you've got going on. And then also like you're an interesting person because you've, you've done all of that with, with such intensity in such a short amount of time. And then also, help like working with other artists like expand it's like really impressive and i'm really happy that you're you're part of our great our greater network and Thanks, now you're Scott. on the winners underground podcast yeah yeah i appreciate it really cool.
Yeah. Well, I feel like you see that because you're doing the same thing. So that's uh, I appreciate. Yeah, I feel like we have a similar you. ethos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. Actually, one of the, the tagline for Banana Island Films from the beginning was create support. And mm. it's like two words, but also like a Good micro support. sentence. Yeah. Um, you know, give, take, like make, make and help others. It's like a similar kind of ethos that I've always been in. Like we have the, we put the logo with the fist. This is like a solidarity, like all artists kind of are welcome here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I feel like you've got something going on that, that expands that out to, to be practical and to provide a, a business angle that's useful to people. Yeah. So in our thank way. You. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. All right. And uh, everybody, thank you for listening in today. Witnessunderground.com for the documentary and the podcast. And we are in a Kickstarter right now. So if you're listening to this in our, we're in our last week, we hit 60, we'll hit 66% today and we've got almost 200 people. So check out the campaign. It's super important that we get funded so we can get this movie out on common streaming services and go and support Augustus Watkins with his company, Give Take. It's a record label and listen to his music, Bijou Noir. And what was the other project again? Uh, Tulip Tiger, Death Dance. Tulip Tiger. Might even be forgetting Tulip that. Tiger. Hey, yeah. shout out to Anthony Mathenia. He had some uh, internet connections, had uh, issues and had to drop off, but shout out to Anthony too. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. All right, everybody. Take care. <laughs>